count them? Hello and welcome to our board meeting for tonight, uh, May the 3rd, a pre-agenda meeting. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Bob, would you mind doing roll call for me? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Alfering. Here. Ms. Bradrick. Here. Ms. Bretz. Here. Ms. Zibatoni. Here. Mr. D'Augustine. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. Mr. Ward. Here. Dr. Learn. Here. Dr. Bompiani. Here. I believe the reps are online. Gianna Richardson, you there? Here. How about here. Jacob? Jacob's at a lacrosse game, so he's not here. All right, thank you. You're getting wet. Before we get started, I wanted to inform everybody that the, our board went into an executive session following the meeting on Monday, April 19th, 2021, to discuss personnel-related matters. Our executive session began at 9.30, and we ended at 10.17 p.m. This evening, we met for an executive session um, on 5.3, from 5.35 to 7.05. That was for legal and personnel issues, including a report on our teacher contract negotiations. We will be meeting for an assured executive session on personnel issues immediately following. No vote will be taken after that. So we'll move on to um, reading of the mission statement. Gianna, would you mind taking that? Yes, I got it. Thank you. The Hempfield Area School District and its commitment to excellence shall engage and educate all students for personal success through a shared responsibility with the student family community in a safe, secure, and nurturing environment. Thank you so much. And Superintendent's Report, Dr. Wilicki. Thank you, Dr. Bompiani. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We have several items listed for our report this evening, and the first is going to be a very exciting presentation of what has been occurring at Stanwood Elementary and collaboration between our art teacher, Dr. Wendy Milney, our music teacher, Mrs. Natalie Williams, and we also have a student with us this evening, we have Megan, who will be joining us, and our Stanwood Elementary principal, Mrs. Bruner. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Reefenak so she can provide some introductions as we um, lead into this presentation. Thank you so much. So this program has been happening at Stanwood Elementary, and I don't want to take a lot of their thunder because they are here and very excited to speak about it to us. But I did have the opportunity to go to a training for this um, partnership, and it was really amazing um, in the creative ways that we can incorporate um, different I guess modalities of art into into third grade and have that that experience for our, for our students. So I am very excited. Um, I am going to turn it over to Mrs. Bruner, and she's going to start us off here this evening. But but as I said, the the work is very impressive. Um, I wish everybody could see. There's some um, the third grader here brought a product with her. I wish we could show that to everybody. Um, but the board members certainly here will enjoy it. So we are looking forward to hearing what your experience was. having us uh, with you this evening. We're very excited to share the work of our third grade students. As Dr. Riefenack mentioned, um, we started um, a residency with the Attack Theater Group. Um, it was a 10-day residency, and we began that in December. And this has been a program that Dr. Milney has facilitated for the last three years. They can't hear me. There we go. <laughs> um, I'm just Bob used to, to being rest. loud, even with a mask on. Um, but this is something that we, um, Dr. Mil Milney has facilitated for the last three years with our third graders. So all of the third, fourth, and fifth graders at Stanwood have had an experience with attack theater. So moving into this year, we had um, some challenges that faced us, like uh, most of the rest of the year. Uh, and in working with attack theater, they were fantastic um, in looking at how we could adapt and modify the experience. Uh, for online learning. So they actually did begin with our students in December when we were virtual. And as Dr. Riefenack mentioned, we started with a PD, uh, a professional development for all of our staff. Uh, so Dr. Riefenack, myself, the third grade teachers, and then Dr. Milne and Mrs. Williams also participated with the Attack Theater staff with that. And then um, they, the students actually participated from home during the month of December. And then when we returned, 
our attack theater staff was still virtual with us, but we participated, the, the students were obviously in person in art class and music class. And I did want to mention, um, this was a product of a $10,000 grant that came from SAMA, the Southern Allegheny's Museums of Art, and uh, the PA Council for the Arts. And um, the other thing, and, and we're going to share, uh, I know Dr. Wilicki has some video put, uh, pulled up of the experience, but what is really neat is that Attack Theater is actually using the platform that they created in conjunction with Dr. Milne and Mrs. Williams um, for other students in the area. And it also was a really great way for us to share with parents how the students had been participating. Um, so the product they created was very, um, very interesting. So at, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Milne, who's gonna share what things look like from art class. And um, we're just really grateful for their work. And I, and I can't thank Dr. Milne and Mrs. Williams enough for their dedication to making sure that our students had this experience. Thank you, Mrs. Bruner. Um, good evening, my name is Wendy Milne, and I've been working with Attack Theater on and off for about 20 years. In particular, this year was the third year of our residency, and we talked Sorry. over the summer and said, we definitely want to do something. These kids are dealing with these uncertain times. They didn't know what we were going to be doing, so we, instead of dealing with architecture as we have in the past two years, we decided, let's talk about emotions. And how can we use artwork to have students express their emotions? How can we use movement to have them express their emotions? Especially because they've been sitting on the computer for so many days and weeks. And we wanted to get them up and moving at home as well as in the art classroom and the music classroom. So we came up with this idea of how do we do this virtually? What does this mean to me? What does it mean to the other teachers? And we started to get the kids involved and looking at artwork that were on display at the Ligonier site and the Loretto site of the Southern Allegheny's Museum of Art. So they started looking at this artwork and in art class, we would critique the artwork. So that meant, what does it look like? What kind of lines do you see? What feelings are you getting from this painting? And we were all jotting down different notes as the kids, that's some of the great music that was developed for this. And so we were talking with the kids like Megan and asking them what they saw in the paintings. So the dancers would then do some movements and lead the kids in some movements. Hey, what would this look like? What would this painting look like with these very diagonal lines and what could we do with our bodies to represent that? What kind of feelings might we see? So then we talked about different ways we could create some artwork in that and different ways we could mold things out of clay, which Megan I think has an example of. And then, my favorite day was I learned from the dancers because I'm no dancer and I said I'm going to teach them the way that the dancers were teaching them. So we looked at a painting by Ron Donahue, he's a local artist, has a lot of artwork at the Westmoreland Museum and we looked at his and it had a bunch of houses and Megan you might remember we started talking about I see a lot of repetitive lines, what could that look like? So the kids all did this and what we did for Attack Theater was we came up with our own kind of dance. I videotaped the kids and we sent that video back to Attack Theater in response to what they were teaching us. So they took our dance and our words and they created a whole bunch of videos, nine of them to be specific, and they made these professional videos to take other kids on virtual field trips from all over the world. And that's on their um, the SAMA website, as well as the Attack Theater website. So that's what we've been doing. My final activity that I have been um, looking forward to doing is, I really wanted the kids to have something special to end this year, and I really wanted to respond to Attack Theater in a visual way. So what we've been doing kindergarten through fifth grade for the past two weeks or so, is we've been making a mural. Each of the kids made a clay tile, that had a little movement on them. So third and fourth grade did movements and fifth grade did large figures with movements on them. And I have um, about 50 more to fire in the kiln. So we are, we've been doing clay, we've been glazing, we've been doing painting, we're doing every possible thing we can to make sure these kids get a great art experience. And I'm hoping to install the mural um, maybe starting Friday. So we're hoping for that. I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie Williams and Natalie's gonna tell how she used this project in music class. 
So I was uh, asked to contribute a couple ideas for music to go along with our project, and um, we chose uh, the movements of winter and spring from Vivaldi's Four Seasons because it was really conducive to visualizations and, um, and feeling emotions. And so I had the students listen to some of that, and we did some creative movement with that. And then we translated um, or they were allowed to jot down some ideas of you know, things they were visualizing, emotions they were feeling, and we took all of that information and translated it into small group instrumental projects using our classroom instruments. So we had all of these um, little pieces that we videoed and sent over to the attack theater. Um, and then another thing we did, they sent us some paintings to look at as well. Um, we kind of had the same concept where we for, well, first they asked us to come up with some sound words. So we came up with words like crunch and ah, you know, things like that. And so they had to come up with some movements to go with that. So we had this um, sequence of movements. And then we took that and translated into um, different things we could do on the instruments to create those same types of sounds, which we tied together to make one large class piece. So of course each class's piece was different and unique because they all had different ideas of what they saw and felt and heard. So we sent that as well. Um, so basically, as uh, Dr. Milne was saying, they took all of our ideas, all of the kids' music creations, all of their art creations, um, all of their movement creations, and used it to inspire a final professional video, um, which was so exciting for the kids to see, I think, because they got to see their creations finally put into action by this professional performing group. So I think it was pretty exciting for all of us, really. Um, so we do have a student here, Megan Kabanek, who's going to speak about her personal experience as a student. Hi, my name is Megan Kabanek, and I am a third grade student at Stanwood. Dr. Mowney has asked me to talk to you about my attack theater experience. One of my favorite artworks presented by attack theater was Wind Arch Fire Cave. The presenter showed the class a painting, and they had us guess what the painting was about. They continued to ask questions about the textures and the seasons. In our class, they had a musician play summer music, and I had to sculpt a clay representation of the season. My clay sculpture represents summer, winter, and spring. During December, attack theater continued virtually. They showed us a painting, and we discussed how it made us feel what it looked like in any other observations. We would like to take, we would take some of our ideas and turn it into a dance. I feel like this really helped during virtual learning because we had to sit all day and this helped us get moving. I really enjoyed the experience Attack Theater gave me. So the, sorry, the painting that Megan was referring to, we went through and looked at all the paintings and Megan said this one was her favorite one, the experience. So Dr. Wilicki is going to play the dance that Attack Theater came up with based on this painting. And there were, um, there's a Grammy award winning musician who also choreographed and, and wrote all the music for this too. You're seeing Simon, Peter, who's one of the originators of Attack Theater, Miranda, and Sarah were our dance educators that worked with us. So every movement that you see there is based on that painting, but really based on everything that the kids told them that they saw, as along with those other paintings that you would see. So we wanted to open up for any questions or comments that you have for Megan or any of us. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here and share our excitement and love of art and music with you.
Megan, I don't care what anyone says, but you stole the show up there today. <laughs> Thank knew, you so much. We knew she would. That's why we brought her. <laughs> yep. It's not easy for someone your age to come here and talk to a bunch of old people and get your point across. Did that, did that group there show what you kids thought in your mind when mm -hmm. you did your work? They did pretty much exactly what we showed them. I hope you get royalties on whatever that sells. <laughs> well, and they did um, make sure they dedicated it to Stanwood and they attributed all of that. There's a big, long scrolling part that talks about the that, third grade contributions. That's cool, but I'm going to be her agent and I want her to get a little bit of money, too, <laughs> if that's possible. Yes. Okay, board members, we'll go around the room. Uh, Scott, why don't you go ahead first? Any comments? No, it's, it, it's a beautiful job. I think you guys do a great job there and uh, please keep it up. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm speechless, which is probably a gift for everybody. Um, it, that's amazing. That's amazing. With all you had, all of you, when you, all of you had what you had this year, and you, you did this, you created this, and you learned, and you had fun, and you, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, I guess what, what Dr. Bompiani said, uh, Megan, great job speaking. I mean, I, as you get older, you realize how important it is to be able to speak to a group, and it looks like you, like you already have that mastered quite well, so uh, great job tonight. And, and like uh, Mrs. Sebatoni said, um, it's great to see that you had fun with the project, and, and the piece of work that's going being passed around is very, very nice. So great job. I, I do want to share, I was able to observe the day the students watched the videos in art and music class. And it was amazing to see the students' response because like Megan said, what they did is exactly what the students created and came up with. So to watch it through the eyes of the, the students seeing it was even more spectacular because they really felt so empowered with their creativity. It was, it was really cool to see as a, as a principal and yeah. I know for the, our teachers as well. Jean? Jeannie? Well, <clears throat> I was very impressed, but not surprised. <laughs> I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Milne for a few years. And um, I, Megan, you did an outstanding job. I, I was just, I did have a question. I was wondering what, what were the types of information that you sent to that group? Could you give, could somebody give me an example of something that was sent that they then replicated in their dance? So we did like, I know for the four seasons, they made us do movements for summer, spring and winter. And they actually, I saw in there, they used some of the movements that we did with them, so. Hmm. One of the paintings that you didn't see was by our former high school art teacher, Joe Shieldkamp, so some of you might remember Joe, and it was called Mutation, and the kids talked about the bright colors and the, the curves and the lines and how it repeated and how they were able to move. So the dancer, Dane, put up nine different screens and he sort of had a shadow effect as he danced behind it. I really encourage all of you to go on to the Attack Theater website and go to the little black button that says, take the tour and you can watch all the videos. They're about two minutes each and hear the music that was written for it and see the dances because they're really fun. The, the Peter, he had a big ladders that he put into one that he did and he moved his way through the ladders. So we, we, could, we could spend much time, but we'll, oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you and thank you for coming to share this with us. Thanks. Yep. Outstanding job, congratulations. Megan, is that your parents? Mm -hmm. All right, congratulations. <laughs> Won't they stand up? Where? I don't, they're hiding behind the corner. You raised a wonderful daughter, let me tell you. Uh -huh. Mike? Yes, yeah, very, very nice. Megan, you, you did an outstanding job. I have a question, though. Did you, um, what did you take more from it, the art aspect or the dance? Um, we, took it, we took it from both, but a little bit more for the, from the art. Very well done. And Sonia? Uh, unfortunately, I, I couldn't see the presentation here, so I, I'm just listening to all your comments and um, sounds like it was wonderful to see, but great job what they could do with COVID. 
that just shows the dedication our teaching staff has. So that's awesome. Jen, you have a link on there for Attack Theater. If you um, click on the link, you can get the dance. You have to go through it a little ways to find it, though. Yes. And Jennifer, any comments or questions? Yeah, great job. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. And, and, you know, it's so nice to see you here because we know how important the arts music is to our children's learning. And like Diane said and several other board members said, you know, this year has been really challenging for everyone. <coughs> our adults, we, we can feel it and everything. We see it. We can't feel it like you do, Meg. And you're making it so much easier for us just to see how you perform and how you do your things. And you come in here so calm. And just like Gianna that's on, on uh, the, the video, when you, you, when you students talk to us and we see that we're still making strides forward, you calm us down and you relax us. Such a great job you've done and such a great job with all of you. I did have one comment, uh, Dr. Milne. Um, my grandson up in Boston, there's a thing called Artsonia. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Okay, because my wife spends hundreds of dollars on that. And I know a lot of that goes back to the school, I think. So. It does, and I'm, I'm hesitant in using art as a fundraiser. We don't consider it a fundraiser. I tell you, she's got these things <laughs> everywhere, magnets, and his, yes. his art is magnets everywhere. Yeah, it, it's a teacher. great program. I just I go back and forth on asking parents to spend money on extra things. You wouldn't have to ask my wife. She'd be yeah. on my mind. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of grandparents that would be very excited about buying things. They would be. It's really nice. Yes. Anyway, thank you so much. I mean, and thank I can't you. say enough about you, Megan. Your parents better be really happy that they've raised such a good girl like you. Thank you for coming here and sharing everything with us. I can just make a quick comment in closing. Today is teacher the beginning of Teacher Appreciation Week. So having two teachers here with us this evening, I think it's also a great opportunity for us to say thank you to all of our teachers for all the hard work that they put forth all year, and especially given the circumstances this year. And I think that shows um, Megan's work here this evening, shows the efforts of our teachers in supporting our students. So I yep. just want to say thank you. And also, Dr. Milney, recently published a book. I think that's oh. also a huge accomplishment. So very Thank proud you. of all of all of your hard work. It, so. it might be coming over to the Greensburg Library. I was going to say, do you want a book discussion? <laughs> yes. I apologize. Now I, I do believe a round of applause is certainly warranted. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you so much. You all have to stay for the rest of the meeting, you know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Hey, I'm in the kiln. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You too. I'm going to apologize to Dan Anthony because he has to follow the student presentation, right? No one wants to follow the students because they always do such a phenomenal job. So with the onset of spring, we are preparing for summer projects, and we did ask Dan as our facilities manager to be here this evening and to share with us the plans for the summer. It looks like it's going to be an extremely busy summer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan as he takes us through the plans. Thank you, Dr. Rolicki. Hi, my name is Dan Anthony. I'm with the District Facilities Department. And I want to begin by saying thank you to the board for giving me this opportunity to present tonight. I have a presentation, it's about 12 slides, so if we could just queue up slide two, Dr. Wilicki, we can get started. The, the information you'll find on this slide is our life safety inspections. We typically do these annually. We schedule them in the beginning of the summer. As you can see in the right column, we address issues like our fire extinguishers, our sprinkler systems, our fire pumps, fuel station, and fire suppressions, our fire alarm systems, our kitchen ansel systems, we do testing and inspections on our fire hydrants. We clean our hoods in the kitchens. Elevator and lift inspections are scheduled. Stage rigging inspections are also scheduled. And we have a grease service uh, from each kitchen from the grease trap. And they will be scheduled. And we're currently in process of scheduling those contractors in. Typically begins probably the second week of June. So we'll get through graduation, hit the ground running starting uh, June 7th. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. The next slide is the high school. Some of the projects at the high school will include the pool. Uh, we're replacing the inlets. We're regrouting the pool. We're repairing the stretch ceiling panel that was damaged over the Christmas break. 
the, I'm actually uh, pleased to present that we have already replaced the boiler. It is up and running. We plan on installing a new a dust collector. We're gonna paint the old dust collector. The auxiliary gym, please report to this group as well. Share that we have completed that project as well. I will be working on the access road from the Haynes House property to the high school property. We'll do our kitchen preventative maintenance. We will do preventative maintenance on the air handler and rooftop units here at the high school. And we plan to repair the curbs and paint them as well. Next slide, please. The next slide is the field house and stadium. Uh, we're scheduled to have the turf replacement. Uh, we'll be resurfacing the running track. We'll be painting the press box steps and handrails. We'll pressure wash the field house and we'll install the metal edging caps on top of the field house to prevent the staining that is coming down the walls of the field house. Next slide, please. Errol Middle School, we plan to replace the gutter outside the cafeteria. We'll also be painting that dust collector. We'll complete kitchen preventative maintenance and we will paint the curbs. Next slide. Thank you. Wendover Middle School, we'll be partnering with our uh, IT department. We'll be installing new cameras we will, install, we will be installing weather stripping on exterior doors, specifically the doors located at the loading dock in the kitchen area. We'll be completing the preventative maintenance in our kitchens there as well. We will also be painting the curbs at that facility. Next is West Hemphill Middle School. Our plan is to convert the metal halide gymnasium lighting to LED. We'll continue our univent coil cleaning in the classroom. We'll be looking at a sanitary line. We need to do a slope correction. We'll do, we will be doing kitchen preventative maintenance. We'll be doing curb painting, and we'll be addressing the fire hydrant areas where we replaced last year. We'll be adding topsoil and seeding those areas. Fort Allen, we will be replacing carpet with vinyl composite tile. We will be rekeying the exterior doors. We'll be doing stump grinding. Kitchen preventative maintenance is also scheduled in that building courtyard tree trimming, curb painting, and playground mulching as well. <coughs> Next is Maxwell. That building will also have the exterior doors rekeyed. We have 12 remaining classrooms to finish with the Univent coil cleaning. Kitchen preventative maintenance is scheduled. Curb painting and sidewalk repairs are also scheduled. West Hemfield Elementary School, we'll be we will be handling the site prep for the new PTO playground. We're planning on doing landscaping improvements at the main entrance. Kitchen preventative maintenance is also scheduled. Curb pa painting and playground mulching is also on the list this summer. At West Point, we will be doing a new sensory room. I have a meeting scheduled May 25th with uh, Mrs. Darla Bryant and Mrs. Dell to address that. This building will also have their exterior doors rekeyed. Kitchen preventative maintenance is scheduled. Playground mulching and curb painting will also take place this summer at that building. Fanwood Elementary, we, we will be replacing the leaking boiler pipe section. We will pressure wash the front of that building. Kitchen preventative maintenance and curb painting is also scheduled at that building. The Cyber Center, which is down at the bus garage, we plan to finish the walls and paint. And that concludes my report, and I would open it up if there's any questions. I'd be happy to answer for you. Any members, any board members have questions? I'm not going to go around the room. It's, it's up to you guys to open up anything. And Sonia or Jennifer, any questions? Okay. Um, what do we, yeah, I have one. What do we have budgeted for summer help this year, either Dan or Wayne, if you could answer that? Uh, we'll be asking for approval for four. Uh, students here at, at the uh, next board meeting. Uh, two are current seniors and two are uh, currently enrolled in college. One for the central duplicating. Uh, one will want, go to uh, the custodial side as a substitute and two will be assigned to the grass crew. So just four from when we usually would be like 13 to 15. We had reduced that from a management standpoint. Uh, we, we couldn't effectively manage that large number. And honestly, we're hiring the four that applied. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we used to turn kids away. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, any other questions, yeah. Jennifer? Or Scott, go ahead. Well, Dan, how does this list, I know we get the list every year and I appreciate the, the update. How does this list compare to previous years? I mean, are we seeing that, that as we're keeping up with things, it's, it's a little more manageable or, I mean, we're probably always playing some man, That's man a good catch question, up, Dr. Learn. I think that it's comparable to previous summers. I know that I have a companion document that I work off that gives me the ability to look at like man hours. And I think that we, this is a very, I didn't want to overpromise and under deliver. So I'm looking at getting something that's feasible completed by the end of the summer in each shop. So I think that this list, we took a look at the business office and we had, you know, many discussions of what we could feasibly complete over the summer. And I, I'm comfortable and confident that we can complete everything on this list. Thank you. If that answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer, anything online? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Really nice report, Dan. Thank you very much for updating us. And uh, it's nice to see you're doing maintenance like this and keeping up with everything. That'll help us as we do the feasibility and everything. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. The third segment of the report, and I know it's we're all looking forward to summer and warm, sunny days. But it's actually in regards to the district's application for what are called flexible instructional days, which relate to winter. So our presentation is going to be facilitated by Dr. Riefenack and Dr. Connor, I believe, is contributing as well. We're going to be looking at snowflakes here for a little bit because it, as it relates. So We're going to cool Riefenack down well. yeah, with our snowflakes here. We're talking about a flexible instructional day. Um, and this is a concept that the state put into place as a pilot, I believe, in 2017, 2018. And they had um, a handful of districts take advantage of that. And then they passed the law that said that this was permissible in 2019. So if you look at the next slide. Um, I did copy the law and, and the reference code there if anybody's interested. But basically what they're saying is now we can have what an FID, you'll, call, you'll hear me call it FID throughout FID, um, a flexible instructional day to count as one of our 180 required instructional days. So what this means is um, Dr. Wilicki, if approved by the state when the application goes through, will have the opportunity to take a weather day and have it be essentially a remote learning day. Um, we have, there's limits on this and there's requirements to get approved and that's what I'm going to go through tonight and, and give you an update on where we're at with the process and what happens next. So that law was passed in 2019 and then if we get approved, so after we turn in the application which is due by June 1st, we will have a three year approval. So this is not something that needs renewed each year which is nice. Um, so I listed the years there so we'd have three years of the ability to utilize the flexible instructional day. Each year, those who implement FID will have to fill out a survey by the end of April. The state wants to collect data essentially on how many people are using it, how it was used, and then the, the highlights and the insights about how the programming is working so they can adjust as they go with their application process. And finally, the, one of the stipulations is an FID day cannot be used for a partial closure. So if we had, so right now with COVID-19, we have had some remote learning days due to a building having COVID cases. This is for an entire district. So this, that is one of the stipulations on this. It is essentially designed for weather events or things of that nature, or if the entire district has to be shut down for, heaven forbid, a, a natural disaster type situation, an FID day would be permissible. So the application process has essentially four parts. The first part is what the administrative team is working on now, which is the narrative. Um, it asks several, I think, believe it was six questions, six or seven, um, and it asks questions such as, how will students know about an FID day? How will um, you communicate to the, to the masses when one is called? And, and most of those things are communication tools and practices we have in place for our normal communication traffic. So things using our Remind, using our Skyward Messenger, using, using those pieces as we would if we were going to call a snow day or cancel school for any reason, um, using our media outlets and pieces like that. So they just want to confirm that we have those things in place in the event of an FID. Um, in addition, they also want to know about instructional pieces of our plan for remote learning. They want to ensure that these are valuable days and aren't just kind of a snow day um, without instruction. So that goes to the next part Dr. Connor's going to speak to. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Riefenack. Uh, portion two is e exemplar lessons, and, and this section we are working with our department heads and grade level leaders 
to obtain exemplar lesson plans um, from each level of the district. Obviously, when we talk about this, this school year we've had a lot of practice with remote learning. Um, so we are really going through the process, working with them, trying to find um, the best of the best to mm -hmm. share with the state. There is a specific format that has to be put in um, for the state representatives to see and to approve. And um, we have received, I think, half of mm -hmm. um, those requested thus far. So we'll be putting it together along with the rest of the application. Yes, and, and those lessons include things like conditions on, well not conditions, but contingencies if a child's internet does not work that day during, due to the bad weather or things like that. How would you help that student with the missed material? Or if you know that that student may not have internet access for whatever reason, how would you help them ahead of the, the flexible instruction day? So they want to make sure that you've thought about any contingency possible within that process. On the next slide, there's some assurances that we have to check off on, and largely, as I mentioned before, it's around communication. They really want to make sure that we have a communication plan in place to ensure that everybody knows what to expect and everybody knows what's going to happen when we have an FID. Um, some other pieces that they want to ensure is that IDEA and FAPE, so those all the needs of all learners are being met. Um, they want to make sure that we have thought about that and that, our, that our, all populations are receiving their services to the best of our ability on these days. In addition, tech support and cyber safety are mentioned, um, which I've talked to uh, Mr. Wagner, and we do have a lot of things in place as we've been doing a lot of remote learning this year that would carry over into a flexible instructional day. Things like our securely filters and our ability to have our tech tickets and support put in when needed. Uh, one more quick thing on the insurances, I apologize. I skipped the attendance. One big check mark on the flexible instruction day is attendance still needs to be taken according to PA school code. So we have to have a plan for accounting for attendance for that day. So we still have our school calendar that was approved not too long ago for next year, for that 2021-2022 school year. And I've listed here our snow days that are within the calendar. Um, we still have those five snow days and there's no intention of removing those from our approved calendar. Because with a flexible instructional day, you really want to ensure that the students and staff have enough notification to have it be a meaningful instructional day. So sometimes if we feel like the weather would probably just you know, when we look at, when Dr. Rolicki looks at it, um, she might say, well, it, it looks like it'll probably be a two hour delay and we'll be good to go. And it might be a little worse. We, we all know, we've, we've lived in Pennsylvania. Um, and so that day may have to become a snow day and then we'd have to use a snow makeup day. Again, we don't want to make this something that we're scrambling to have. We want that flexible instructional day to be meaningful and we want everybody to be prepared and not be overstressed by the fact that it's a remote learning day. So those so planned snow days are still in there for those cases. Flexible instruction will be used when advance notice is, is possible. So we'd like to use those, but sometimes reality and weather don't play along. And so ne a couple next steps, I didn't include a slide with this, but we are completing this document and it is in a digital format, but we will print out the components for the, for the school board to review in the next two weeks. Um, and we will be asking for school board approval to submit and move forward with this process at the next meeting so that we can submit it within that June 1st timeline safely. They do ask for board approval and they want you to be involved in that process and understand where we're going with it. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Rather than go around the room again, any board members here have questions? Any? When you say they're pre pre planned, which I so in other mm -hmm. words, if we are told on the TV or radio mm -hmm. that we're going to get this horrific storm and it's pretty concrete that that's going to happen, mm -hmm. we could then say we're going to have a day tomorrow. Yes. And then that's what you're talking about being able to pre plan yeah. in, in that manner. But if we got hit with something, that was unexpected, that would not be, we would not do that. Right, and, and as I said, we don't want to add, we want it to be that meaningful instructional day, so we don't want to add that scramble or that panic with an immediate, like, you know, 6 a.m., it's all of a sudden a flexible instructional day. We didn't know that was a possibility. That would be a snow day then, and we'd use our snow makeup days. Yeah, and we're gonna, being the first year of implementing it, we're gonna feel it out, um, but again, the intention really is not to throw anybody into a last minute scramble. We really want to make sure that that time is allotted for materials and um, devices and things to make sure everybody's ready to go. Any other questions? Paul? I have a question. Um, 
you said that this would be approved for three years if it's mm -hmm. done. If, um, and I don't know if you answered this already, but if, if the district does this in year one and, and decides that it, it maybe isn't effect, as effective as we think it would be, we don't have to take it the other years, I assume, right? No, and there's no obligation to use it even in the first year. So um, I, I actually was approved in my previous district, and the first year I don't, well, we went into COVID then eventually in March, but we didn't actually call an FID day because of weather. We just didn't need it. Um, so there's no obligation or requirement to use so many days. You do have a maximum. I don't know if I mentioned this, but you do have a maximum of five days through the year. So we can use up to five flexible instruction days. You cannot go beyond that. Beyond that would have to be a snow day if you got in that situation. Thank you. Yeah. Scott? Dr. Wilicki, is this, uh, I remember last year when the when the, you know we were getting ready to shut down for the pandemic or is this similar to the days you applied for last year that I think there was like five days that we kind of did it in a it was short term like you had to do it because we didn't know for sure what the, with the uncertainty of the pandemic and I remember you utilizing those for for staff for education and things it's similar to that or is that something different I do recall what you're referring year. to. Yes, so there was a process where we could apply to have remote days that would count as our instructional days. Okay. Yes, because of the pandemic, they did allow us to bypass this application process. Oh, so, I see. That's, yes, that's but, what I was wondering. So it's a similar thing. It's just last year was kind of short term. I mean, it, it was. It was, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions in here? Um, Jennifer, any questions? No, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. And Sonia? No, I'm good. Okay, thank you. And, and Kim and Matt, um, I, it's nice that you're doing this. It's, it's a, I mean, that's what we perceived too whenever we put, we wanted the um, HACA. And now you can utilize it and maybe not have these kids have to worry so far into June, you know, mm -hmm. graduation. It's so nice, very nice. Flexibility. Yep, I think so too. Okay, thank you very much. The final segment of my report this evening is in regards to the um, English language arts curriculum. So at our last board meeting, we had a presentation by the new curriculum adoption for the next school year, which was in um, the subjects of art, music, and physical education. So we do want to take a pause to take a look back to what was presented to the school board in May of 2020 with our English language arts curriculum, because that did have a phased in um, plan. So Dr. Riefenack has put together a PowerPoint presentation to provide an overview because this does have a budgetary impact. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. So um, we are American Reading Company, or ARC. We're in year two of implementation. So this past year, um, they began with 31 classroom teachers. These were called SEED teachers, and it was SEED on purpose. That was Dr. Connor's term, which is fantastic. You're welcome. Um, because we're taking a seed and we're growing it. So these 31 teachers were planted with the materials and they were given the resources and coaching and support from the district and the ARC company. And they have been taking time this year throughout our professional development days and throughout different um, opportunities that have come up just time that we've had to speak with their peers about the implementation, what worked, what didn't work. This year, of course, came with its challenges with social distancing restrictions and small group restrictions. However, the, this team has worked so hard to implement this program and, and ask the questions to the team and ask the art coaches how the best way to approach these pieces are. And they've really done a, a wonderful collaborative job of doing this and they've put a lot into it and I'm really excited to see where they take it post COVID when some of these other activities can be implemented as well. But they've done this fantastic job. We even had one teacher do it in Hacka, completely cyber, um, and really, really found value in this. So we're taking these 31 teachers and it's time to grow this year. Um, and with that growth, obviously comes, you know, those next steps and what's happening. So if we go to the next slide, I'm not going to go over the executive summary or the presentation that you saw in May again. However, I have linked them both here. If you would like to review them before our next meeting, if you have any questions or, or something you don't recall, I did put them both here. Um, and I've reviewed them and I've been in art classrooms throughout the district and really found this to be a powerful resource and a powerful way to have... Um, open discussions about positive literacy instruction for our early learners. So it's um, definitely taken us in a different 
direction to meet each learner's needs, which is very exciting. Um, so it was a two-year rollout plan from the beginning, as I understand it. I came in a little later in that, but um, as I understand it was presented as that two-year plan. So this is year two, and we hope to finish this implementation this year. So this will end that implementation part of this, not the work or what we're doing, but it will end that. Um, it does include a lot of professional development next year. I don't want to miss that piece because next year with it being a complete implementation with all of our teachers of ELA, they're going to need that support and we, we, we are working to provide that as part of this plan. So with the budget coming up, here are the two numbers that we'd like to utilize to finish this implementation. So um, out of the HASD budget, we're looking at $769,100, um, which is uh, close to what was estimated from what I understand. Um, this would be the units, books, and online access for each building. So these are the large kits of materials that each ELA teacher would need to implement this within their classroom. And when I talk about large packs of material, we're talking books um, for these these learners to get in their hands. We want them to be reading. We want that, that literacy at their level. We want them to be able to feel successful with their reading. And this really does provide that. And it does provide a variety of topics and, and opportunities for them to have that those books in their hands. So it's very powerful stuff. Um, so that is that first cost. The second one was getting a little more creative with our stimulus dollars. There are There's going to be a need for HACA to continue, and I want them to have the materials they need to be successful as well for that full implementation. So being able to use the ESSER dollars to get them additional online access um, and complete unit sets so they have those to send home with kids even though they're in that virtual environment. And we added the intervention kits to this expense because with one of the ESSER's requirements is to address learning loss, and the intervention kits in the ARC programming are fantastic for that. So this allowed us to have that additional access to those to get in teachers' hands as a resource as we continue to help learners, um, you know, gain some of that ground that, with some of the inconsistency of in remote instruction and things, they can get some of that ground back. So we added that to our ESSER dollars. So that's how we broke down the cost of the final implementation. I can just interject, our current reading program in the elementary has been in place, now this is for the teachers that are not a part of the SEED, they have been using Reading Street for at least seven years, and, and it is at a point at where those materials are outdated, and it is really necessary for us to provide our children with more current materials so that they can better meet the standards, and it's not uncommon for an elementary English language arts adoption for a district our size to cost close to a million dollars because it does impact all of our elementary children in grades kindergarten through five. And as Dr. Reefenek shared, there are many, many materials that are a part of the program. So a portion of this was paid last year for it's the seed teachers and that cost was at approximately 250,000 thereabouts. Take. And then as you can see, the remaining cost here really is probably within the ballpark of what we would have paid for Reading Street seven years ago. And I would say the, the, a little bit over that, that million mark comes and comes with some of the additional costs with the HACA, which again is what that stimulus dollars are really designed for, um, and those intervention kits, because we really don't want to, there's opportunity, they'll still be sharing some of those, it's not one for each teacher, but having a few more additional ones to be able to purchase those through ESSERS is going to just be beneficial for all. Any questions? Questions from board members, anybody have questions in here? Mike, go ahead. Dr. Wilkie, I know that these these are really really pricey programs. Um, is there, I'm, I'm sure you've looked into it, but it, there seems like there should be a a way to keep up to keep everything more current. I mean, it, it's almost like these books are like laptops. You know, they, they seem to be outdated at some point. I mean, I, I don't know how you would ever figure it out, but I guess what I'm asking is, there a way to make sure that it's always pertinent to real time? So having the online materials sometimes allows us to have access to um, if there are updates, because many times these, these are companies that are producing a product that they upgrade every so many years. And the standards were updated. I know that the new PA core standards, I'd have to look back to the, the year that they were adopted. And I'm not sure that Reading Street was totally aligned to those standards. So what happens is you get companies that are updating their materials to be better aligned to the standards so that our students have a higher achievement level. So I would say that 
A digital access does give you access to some more current materials if they make upgrades in the interim, if they provide that. <coughs> but really at the <coughs> elementary level, you are also purchasing a lot of print materials. Children need to have physical copies of books in their hands and there need to be a variety of levels. So you do a lot of small group instruction to where you're using multiple copies of a large number of titles so that children are able to read books that are at their, what we call their instructional level. So the teacher's choosing books specifically for that child, so it requires them to have really a library of books accessible. And what happens to over time is where, um, as children mm -hmm. are, are hopefully reading, reading those books. There are also many components to an English language arts program, because this includes writing. It's reading, it's writing, listening and speaking, of course. But whenever you get into all the parts of, of writing, there's also the, the phonics part. And I know that's a part that Dr. Riefenack is really taking a look at um, this particular program. All programs are designed to address the standards, but we always find that there are some programs that are stronger in some aspects than others. So sometimes we supplement even with a, purchasing a program such as this to make it even a stronger program for our children. So I think because of the, the complexity of teaching a child how to read requires mm -hmm. a teacher to have a variety of materials at their fingertips, I think that too makes these programs very, very costly. We, we use a curriculum cycle process, as you heard at our last meeting, where it was now the year for the art, phys ed, and music to review their curriculum. ELA was actually last year, but we did a two-year in part because of, we wanted to do that pilot first before you take on a huge, um, I don't want to say just an expense, but you're overhauling your entire elementary English language arts program, which is the heart of what we do in teaching children um, to learn how to read. We wanted to make sure it was the right program. So it kind of extended that into a second year. And we actually did the same thing with math the year before. So where we really want to be revisiting all of our curriculums within a six-year cycle, this one kind of got into seven years because math became two years, ELA now became two years. So we really don't want to get too far beyond that because there is new research and these programs are aligned to the research and we want to make sure that we are current. Sorry, a long answer to your question. <laughs> any other questions in the room? Sonia or Jennifer, any questions? I'm good. Very, very good presentation, Kim. Thank you. And I think that's why there are no questions, because it was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just point out that next meeting, which is May 17th, we will have the adoption of our proposed final budget. So we will be um, compiling that information to share at that time. And that concludes my report. Thank you. And so Matt went out to get the... Um, we have uh, three students, I think, three students wishing to address us. We do. Um, you want to put your masks on, everybody? Welcome. Hi, ladies. Hi, hello. Um, why don't you state your names and go ahead and get started. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. My name is Liberty Nelson, and I am the senior class president. I'm here with Sarah Hayden, who is the vice president, and Taylor Hall, the senior class secretary. So, we came here tonight to represent our class and express our hope to have some normalcy as our time here at Hempfield is quickly drawing to a close. We re the recent heavy-handed control of the administration on senior activities has created signif significant tension within the senior class, bringing us here to speak before you today. For example, the threat that seniors would not be allowed to walk at graduation if we were to dance at the prom spurred significant frustration throughout the student body. It is a universal opinion across our class that after losing so much this year, we deserve even a small sliver of the typical events that we watched each of our preceding senior classes take part in. We would like to request to have a grill day, which is an event that seniors look forward to each year in which a grill team grills burgers and hot dogs outside while other members of the class participate in a car decorating event. Currently, we are allowed to take part in car decorating, but not grill day. As young adults, we are disappointed that these decisions are being made behind closed doors and far exceeding the state and federal COVID guidelines. The Grill Day is an event that can easily be hosted while following COVID precautions, which is why we feel that this is a very fair ask. 
We would like to request that the board host a public discussion and vote over the decision on our senior grill day. In addition to this, as our senior year is coming to an end and final events are being planned, we would like to propose that brief meetings be held between a class officer and administration and board representative to discuss possible COVID safe ways to go about graduation and other important senior events. We recognize that this has been an extremely difficult year and we really appreciate your efforts to keep us in school. However, our class has become too accustomed to losing these major events and we really do not want Grill Day to become another memory that we miss out on. So, once again, we are requesting that the board host a public vote to address our, our grill day decision as well as the graduation plan. While you may just see us as another graduating class, for us, this is our one and only senior year. We want to make, to make the most out of it that we can, COVID or no COVID. Thank you so much for your consideration. You know, normally when we have hearing of citizens, we give a three minute time limit and there's no questions asked and no answers given. But given the fact of this year and what you have been put through, um, and we don't want you to be put through anything. We want you to have a normal life as much as you can. Unfortunately, that is what hasn't been possible, and we apologize to you. We are going to have some questions from board members, and we will uh, try and discuss this with you. Um, I'll lead it off because you, you mentioned you were threatened with not going to walk in graduation if you danced at the prom. Yes, that was... Um, what some of the principals had stated about prom it was going around the school that if we were to dance, um, we weren't going to be allowed to walk at graduation. And I understand the juniors had a prom of their own that the parents put on. Yes, they did. And my grandson went to that, and I thought they did dance. Yes, they did dance. Our, our event was with the school, so we were not allowed to dance. What did you do? Um, we played bingo. <laughs> uh, there were also casino games. So it, it was a good time. They, we appreciated that they held it for us, but um, definitely the graduation threat um, made some frustration within the class as a student body. So what you're requesting is to have a dialogue about the grill day, or you, you requested a vote too? Um, yeah, just so grill day is typically happens the last full day of school, and it's just an event where seniors go outside, grill hot dogs and burgers, and it's um, just kind of a casual thing that they do while decorating cars. Uh, so we were just hoping that you guys could host a public vote or discuss it so we could kind of hear your thoughts on it, um, just to see if we could get it or have a chance. And what? May, may I interrupt yeah, just sure. a second? Go ahead, thank you. Um, so my understanding, and first, thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts. It's, it's very important for us to be able to hear and, and to make sure that communication is occurring between you and the high school administration. So my understanding is in place of the hot dog um, activity because of the congestion that occurs in having students in close proximity, that there was going to be a senior sunrise instead? Yes, senior sunrise is an event that is currently occurring on our final half day of school, which is an awesome thing. Um, the reason why we wanted to come here and ask about the grill day was because it's just an event that's always been kind of looked forward to as a senior class thing that's always happened. And we feel that it's um, pretty fair because it happens outside. I think we could very easily spread out between the car decorating events and the grilling, so. so you want to have both events? Is that what you're, cause yes, were you that, a part of the planning for the senior sunrise? I was, we had a meeting about it today. The senior sunrise was not planned by me. I was not the head of that planning, but the grill day would be a separate event, whether it was on that day or on the day before, which would be the final full day. So my recommendation would be that we support a meeting with, with all three of you and um, high school administration and also Dr. Connor could certainly be a part of that. But a vote at that level, that would not be considered an appropriate board vote. And we want to be supportive of the activities, but it may be important to hear just the safety concerns of administration. And you know, we, we do have to continue to follow the mask mandate. We have to continue to follow the social distancing because we are a public school entity. But I, at the same time, we do want to be supportive of the events. We continue to hold a musical. We continue to hold, in graduation, the plan is we're having a single ceremony for graduation and, and, and trying to make it as normal as possible. So I think it would be important to be able to have that two-way dialogue to be able to hear what the school district is still required to follow. Yes, and we would appreciate that, definitely. Certainly a range. I would like the board, though, informed about this, though, Tammy, um, because I- one second. Uh, yeah. At this point, you, have you asked for a meeting with 
high school administration? That, no. We, no, okay. We were supposed that, to meet with to a principal today, but she couldn't make it. Um, okay. So we wanted to come here because it was the earliest meeting. Okay. Well, there is a chain of command, Liberty, and I, I would um, tell you to go to your principal and talk to your principal and set this up. Now that Dr. Wilicki knows, I'm sure she'll support it. But I don't know how the board members feel. Um, I, I have been very vocal about the mask, mask thing, about everything that's going on, and not, not our school district, not our administration. They've worked hard to stay within the guidelines. But it's getting really close to the point for me where I'm ready to say politically, I don't care anymore. These kids have to have something, and they have to have it now. And I'm just making that comment so everybody knows where I'm coming from. And Mike Brungo, and I'll be talking to Michael Corns about it too because I want to know exactly what our, the ramifications are for us. I understand what the attestation was. I understand what the governor's recommendation was. But you know what? It's getting to the point where we've got to worry about their own health, not only their own health and safety, but also their own emotional health, how they go forward, they've lost their whole senior year. And they couldn't even dance, they played bingo, and they were threatened not to. This, because the other ones didn't do it as a school function, you should have done it as a non-school function, and then you could have danced up the night. I, I don't know, I don't know what other board members think, I'm sorry to rant, but this has me upset. I, I, well, anyhow, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for coming. I, I do support <clears throat> what, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what Dr. Walicki said, I, I think if you, if you have a question, I think you, you should be able to bring it to the next person. And I do believe in the chain of command, but I do, I, I like your recommendation that there be a meeting. But thank you for coming. Other board members, anything, Mike? Yeah, and I, <clears throat> I completely understand the importance of the chain of command, but if I was a senior in high school and I got threatened by a principal the, night, the weekend before, I wouldn't feel very comfortable about going in Monday morning and asking her for anything. Um, and I also, this, this, this is kind of plays along with things that, you know, when I'm out in public, people come up to me and ask me questions and they say that these are board decisions. I mean, you know, we, we, we made a decision to abide by the guidelines, but I'd like for someone to tell me how you're not abiding by the guidelines if you're on a dance floor six feet apart and dancing. I understand slow dancing with your partner or whatever, but that, that, that's a stretch. And to threaten not to walk in graduation, that, that's unacceptable. And I'd really like to get answers as to why that was said. We will certainly inquire if that was stated directly or if that was something that was passed through um, secondhand, thirdhand information. Um, certainly our principals were in a hard position and needing to reinforce the wearing of masks at a social event. I know in talking with them, they said how how they had to, you know, they're district employees. We have a mask mandate and they are required and it was a school sanctioned event. And sometimes the right thing to do is the hard thing to do. And I think having a prom really put our administration in a tough position because they had to uphold the rules. I know in talking with them today, they shared that our students did a wonderful job. They shared that, um, you know, very respectful. They shared that they were thanked at the end of the event by many of our students and saying thank you for holding this because we realize some districts are not having a prom at all because of concerns over the social distancing. I don't know that the dance floor would have allowed for six feet and that was why we discouraged and had instead casino games, um, bingo, I understand there was cornhole and some other kinds of activities even outside which in talking to other superintendents across the county that mirrors what was done in other school districts. So I think for us as a school district to not permit dancing was not out of line with expectations that other school districts were doing the same. So I recognize the fact that it was not the same. However, again, sometimes the hard thing, you know, the right thing is the hard thing. And we were able to provide the opportunity. And, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, in the future outside of school, um, if you wanted to, you know, dance with your friends, you would have that opportunity, but it just cannot be sanctioned by the school district. Yes, and we, we definitely appreciated that you guys let the prom happen. That was a thing that we were all very grateful for. So thank you for that. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I guess what I would say, and I understand, obviously, we need to, um, we respect the, the safety aspect of, of the decisions, um, and a lot of events have been canceled. I guess what I'd like to see on something like Grill Day, because the students have lost so much, is take a look at it and say, how can we do Grill Day, not can we do it, Let's, let's have a grill day and just find a way to do it within the guidelines. And, and, and it sounds like, I know that at least the students think there's a way to do it. Maybe you can bring some ideas as to how it can be you know, socially distanced. 
to, to share with the administration. But I think if we go in with, to it with an understanding of let's, let's do it, let's find the right way to do it, hopefully we don't have to uh, come to a conclusion that it can't be done. Because I, I think we need to um, interpret these, the, you know, the guide. We need to comply, but we also understand interpretation of these things is, is part of what we're doing. So uh, I would lean toward finding a way to do it. Thank you. And thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Anybody else on the board? Scott? Yeah, I, I have a question. So in regards to the um, supposed threat, and Dr. Walicki is going to look into, you know, how it was said and whatever was third hand. But was that ever brought up before, like as you guys were signing up for prom, and had you ever, had, did you hear that threat any time before that? Well, the prom invitation specifically did not state that there was no dancing. However, throughout the process of like planning the prom, figuring out the tickets to Grand March, it was stated that there was going to be no dancing. And that kind of came out later not on an official document. I don't believe it was on the document, but it kind of came out later just through speaking with everyone through prom meetings, um, assemblies held, right. that we were not going to be allowed to dance, yes. So I just, uh, I'm just kind of trying to follow up with this because you know, obviously you guys do appreciate the school putting that on, but yes. it would have been nice to know that before you spent money on a dress and you were gonna be able to go to an event that you weren't gonna be able to dance at, correct? Yes. I mean, it would have been really nice. Okay. I'm just, I just wanted to make that clear because obviously it sounds like it came up and, and if it did come up, you know, at the, at, at the prom or shortly before, that kind of puts you guys in a bad situation too because now you've spent this money and you, your, your expectations were much different than what was, what was told to you before that, right? Well, I, I know on the specific document it didn't state that. I wasn't at the first prom meeting. They could have stated it there, but I believe at that point we had purchased all of our tickets and we were set to go to the prom. But I could, I could be incorrect in stating that. Thank you. Any other board events? Uh, uh, am I on yet? We're on. Um, if you guys, if, the, if it is approved that you guys have a grill day, I will uh, donate the hot dogs to your senior class. Oh, okay? thank you so much. You're welcome. They're not going to be the jumbo. Right? No. Any other qu board <laughs> questions or comments? Girls, I want to thank you for coming, and, and I want to apologize um, to the administration that it's set up this way because we did go over the chain of command. And I don't want you leaving here or anybody leaving here that's listening to this to think that we think this is all administration's fault and problem because as a point of fact, I have to apologize to you, I think, as every board member would think, too, because Dr. Willicki has been informing us all along what was going to be happening. And I do remember you telling us we weren't going to be allowed to have dancing. I never put it in my head, and I don't think any other board member did, that there was a junior prom going on at the same time done by parents where there might be dancing, where we could have addressed the problem beforehand, and maybe you folks could have had your own prom somewhere else if that's what you wanted to do. The administration was only following the guidelines on the dancing part. As far as the graduation part, I have no idea now you're going to go through the chain of command to find out where that came from, how it was, and I'm sure you're going to be treated very, very well with the grill. And I hope, uh, and I'm sure it'll be brought back to us, uh, Tammy, to let us know what's going on, and um, we'll help you out any way we can. And, and, you know, we all apologize to you for what you've been through this year. Uh, it's egregious, and it's no one's fault sitting here. Uh, I feel blameworthy for it because I don't agree with a lot of it, and I, I would like to fight as hard as I possibly can to make it different, but I also feel frustrated because our hands are tied by people in Harrisburg that aren't thinking ahead. They're not thinking about you and your life. There's a lot of um, mental pro health issues with this too. I, I just hope that we can relax this a little bit and, and give you a little bit of normalcy. Diane? Tony, I, I just wanted to say I think we were just thrilled that you guys were having a prom. And you know, it's there may not be details that, that we looked at or maybe someone else noticed until the end. But I mean, we were just, the closer we can get to normalcy for all of you is, is just going to be so much, so much better. And we're trying, but we're also trying to, to you know, go by the guidelines too. Yes. But. And thank you for being so courageous in coming. And I'm sure Dr. Walicki and Dr. Connor will work with you, any administration at the building to work this out. But thanks, girls, very, very much. Thank you very much Thank for listening.
lost my agenda. Gianna next, and she's online. Gianna, are you all ready? Yes, hello. Hello. Um, for my report tonight, I was just going to go over that we did just have our prom and that um, the seniors are currently taking upon the last month of the, of the uh, senior year. Uh, last Friday, we had decision day, so all the seniors were what their future plans were, and um, we're looking into planning some more events, uh, as you, you heard from the past girls that talked. But yeah, we're working to plan some things. That's all I have for tonight. That's it. Wow. <laughs> That's it. Any board members' questions? comments. Gianna, thanks for a good report. It's nice to be kept involved in your life and what you're doing. Um, so listen, or t Tammy, go ahead. May I just right. add, just Gianna, you reminded me hearing your voice um, that I reached out to you through email. Tomorrow we are having a vaccination on site that is supported by Rite Aid and this is for students who are age 16 and older. I want to thank Gianna for helping to arrange some student volunteers to assist with that process. So this is not just for our students who are 16 and older, but any of their family members, as well as any community members. Um, Rite Aid will be here and we'll have sufficient Pfizer vaccinations. That will be the first of, of course, a two dose, and then the second dose is planned for three weeks. So just as a reminder um, to come if there's any interest in that and in, in having a vaccination. What time, what time is that? Three o'clock until seven in the field house. Anything else? And nothing else, Gianna? Nope, that's it. Okay, did you go to the prom, Gianna? I did go to the prom. Did you have a good time? Uh, yeah, I had a great time. I think that um, uh, my senior class took on what we were given and we enjoyed it. We um, went pretty hard at bingo in the casino games. So. <laughs> good for you. I'm glad to hear that. And thank you for a great report. We'll move on to solicitor's report. Mike? I do have one thing to report this evening. At 12.32 uh, p.m. Uh, earlier today, um, Edward Douglas Lee Corns was born Aww. to uh, Michael uh, Corns and his lovely wife. Seven pounds, two ounces, and um, they are doing well. And uh, Michael will be on paternity leave um, <laughs> for the next couple of weeks. But I uh, just wanted to let the board know that um, things went well. Duncan. Yeah. That eye roll was a little bit of jealousy, I detect, or what? Well, no, I, I, I've got two kids from many, many years ago, and so not, there's no, no jealousy. No, no. <laughs> oh, the paternity leave? No, no, no nothing there. <laughs> well, you know what? That was the nicest solicitor's report we've ever had, I think. So congratulations to Michael and his wife. Sure. Uh, board secretary's report. We have minutes to approve uh, at our next meeting on the 17th, and those minutes are from the April pre-agenda and the April regular meeting. You can look at those. If you have any questions when we go to vote for them, you can make your changes or make your case be known. We'll go on now to the pre-agenda meeting and buildings and grounds. Vince? Next week, we will look to um, approve a donation uh, from West Hemfield Elementary PTO for the purchase of three additional pieces of playground equipment from Snyder Recreation. Also, we had a meeting on April 29th. Um, it was just a feasibility, feasibility study planning meeting. We met with Site Logic and Core Architects. Uh, we discussed documentation and process for school visits. Okay. Anybody want to make a comment about the West Hemfield thing? Isn't that the parents club that did such a great job? Yeah, it was amazing. That's awesome. And, uh, they, what, they raised all the money themselves and got grants? And had grants, yes. I think at our last meeting we announced one of the grants that was recently right. um, in the Tribune Review. Well, thanks to them again, and uh, great job. Anything else, Vince? That's it? That's it. Okay, and we'll go on to educational programs. Jeannie? Thank you. In two weeks, we will be asked to approve an agreement between um, Westmoreland Case Management and Supports, Inc., and our district um, that will be effective from July 17, 2021 to July 15, 2023. Okay, thank you, Jeannie, and uh, we'll move on then to Personnel Committee. Diane. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> in a couple of weeks, we will be approving uh, a number of motions. One of them is a retirement of a teacher at Harold Middle. Another is uh, a leave of absence at Harold Middle. Uh, we'll be approving a substitute nurse, uh, a pr 
approving a PCA for the Hemphill Area School District through ESS for the 2020-2001 school year. Uh, we will be approving a bus driver and a uh, school police officer will be transferred from full-time to part-time and then another, another one will be transferred from part-time to full-time. Uh, we will have a, an approval of a substitute custodian and uh, three uh, substitute teachers, one for speech and language, one for mid-level social studies, and one for elementary PAC-4. Thanks, Dan. Any You're board, welcome. Any board members have any questions? Or, Bob, do you have anything to fill in there that you want to talk about or no? Uh, nothing further. There will be a few more motions added uh, for our meeting for the 17th. Okay. And board members are okay? Good with this? We'll move on to Athletic Committee. Paul? Uh, we have... We have nothing uh, on the agenda to approve at the next meeting, but Mr. Rapp and I spoke and we're looking to schedule a meeting sometime the week of May 17th for the athletic committee. And we'll be uh, touching base with Mrs. Sebatoni and Dr. Wilicki and confirming dates. Um, and then the, that meeting will be uh, public notice as, as normal process, so. Are these Mr. virtual, Rapp, oh, are they virtual? Virtual, no, we do it in person. person. Are you doing it in person? It's in person. Where, where do you do it here? I just, okay. Depending upon the number, we've held our, well, I guess we've held several meetings in the boardroom, depending upon the number. Right. Our last athletic committee meeting was here. Here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and then I'll just ask, just to confirm, Mr. Rapp, anything that you have to add this evening? Okay, nothing. That's I, it. Thank you. I had you. a question. Oh, sure. Um, did we have any movement on getting any of our coaches that you were having a difficulty with finding? That's what we're talking about tonight, right? We'll be sharing that in executive following this meeting. Oh, okay. And looking to add those motions for next our next meeting. We'll have them for the okay. 17th. And then this this would be more for this meeting then. Last last board meeting, um, Dr. Um, Bompiani and I both asked that we could make sure that those students who were affected by this, by, you know, the little bit of delay here in getting a coach assigned, um, would be made sure that they were getting their training and field time and things like that. And I just wondered what you were able to do with that, Brandon. Real quick, so I've had uh, the opportunity to meet with, with uh, again, currently if we look at our fall um, programs, we have um, two head coaching vacancies. So I've been able to meet um, with both programs um, in, in where they're at in, in their off season um, and where they look to go moving forward. And I think we have a really good plan in place. Um, again, our hope would be that we would have both of those positions filled um, on the 17th. Um, and you know, we have a pretty good plan in place with those students as to where they'll pick up and resume uh, their off-season program. Um, so we've actually met with them, um, or I have met with a, uh, a group of individuals from each team a few times throughout this process um, so that we make sure not only that we're keeping them in the loop uh, on, on where we're at with the process, but also that we keep um, you know, pulse of, of where they're at in their off-season training and what they're looking to accomplish as well uh, so that we don't let any of those programs fall further behind. So then that some of them have been training then? That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Yep. Okay. That, that it. Anybody else? Any questions? Okay. Anything else, Paul? We're good? That, that's it. Thank you. We'll move on to supplementals. Mike? Nothing to report at this time. Okay. And Finance Committee, Sonia? Yes. Uh, the meeting on the 17th will be looking at the fall athletic bids be awarded to the lowest possible bidder. We will have following deposits to be appointed for the various banks, <clears throat> excuse me, various banks that all the different schools use for their funds for the year. We will be looking to appoint Wayne Wismar as the treasurer for the 2021-22 school year. We will be looking to have approval for the activity fund signatures for the general fund for the board president signature and for the principal for activities for treasurer we'll be looking to approve on the third year of a possible four-year renewal for nutrition inc to come in as our food service management group again we will be looking to extend for photography services for fall pictures 
and senior portraits, once again, for timeless expressions. And then we will have the monies filled in like we do each time for the deposits in our next uh, meeting. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, Wayne, anything to add? We will also have uh, for the 17th the motion to approve the proposed final budget. The actual number, the revenue and, and uh, expense numbers will be known before then. And I'll be adding that for uh, board consideration on the 17th. Okay, good. And, uh, I, Vince, I would have. I would have one question on the Nutrition Inc. one. Is there a reason we do them just on a one-year agreement? I know we went out and did an RFP a long time ago, and then we didn't do the RFP just because of the time-consuming essence of it. But if we're in year three, is there a reason we just don't go out for two years on this? Or well, Actually, Sonia, we did go out to RFP on this, and... Uh, Nutrition Group was awarded a five-year contract, but from the state, they handle food service management companies differently. So even though it's a five-year approval, you have to renew them each and every year. The purpose of that is to give the districts flexibility. If they're having okay. issues with their current food service management company, we are not. But it's a little cumbersome, but it, it just keeps it, keeps it in front of the board. And, and the district, and we do take a look at it each year. So we do have an additional year after this one. Okay, so that then changed years ago then when the RFP came in and that you get to do it every year just to renew it, okay. With, with the last one, yes, Sonia. Oh, okay, okay, because I, I knew we did the RFP and I just didn't know why we had to do this every year then. Thank you for the explanation. You bet. Vince, you had a question? Okay, that's a non-binding five years then? We can end it? Really? Sounds like baseball. Wait, Any other questions? My, I guess my question would be, was it an original? There was an original contract of five years and then four renew? It's five years, but you're, you must renew each year of that. After the first year, you have to renew years two, three, four, and five of the five year. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I don't know if those numbers. You have to show proof to the state. You look at it every year, too, or, I mean, there's no paperwork for you. Oh, yeah, no, there absolutely is. There is a full-blown renewal contract that has to be submitted and, and approved by both the district and the food service management company and the state. It just seems crazy. Then why would we even award a five-year contract if you have to do all the work every year on both parties? I think the renewal is simpler than going out to full-blown. Right. RFP each year. That's that's the advantage. That and, and I think the rationale behind that was that it keeps pressure on the the outside entity that's providing the uh, uh, the services because if they know that even though they've got a five year contract and terms and conditions are established for that five years, if they don't live up to the standard, they could be out. And I think that's one of the main reasons why it was created that way. Any other questions? And that's it, Sonia, correct? Yes, yes, Mr. President. Thank you. We'll move on to Policy Committee. Jeannie? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, in two weeks, we'll be asked to approve um, two policies that have been on for 30 days approval. Uh, one is job-related expenses, and this, if you look at it, is just a little bit of added language. And the um, policy 004 on membership was what we had uh, worked on and been asked to add uh, regarding uh, board members or anyone uh, on the board taking any type of position um, that is a paid position. And then um, the next one that we'll be asked to approve are two fundraisers, one from Harold to sell candy and one from West Point Elementary um, to do a raffle ticket. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Do we have any questions from board members? Thank you, Jeannie, very much. When's your next meeting, did you say? Do you have one yet? We, we do. We do. I have to look at my calendar here. Well, that's okay. I, I, you can let me know later if I can come over. Wednesday morning. Oh. Wednesday. Wednesday okay. morning. Okay. 9.30.
And that's yes. in, in person? My office. At your office? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's usually through ARs or? And, and we'll go over any language, any policies okay. that have minor language changes at that point. If, if there are policies that require more decision making, then we will include the full committee. Okay. Thank you. 707 is the policy that we have been working on. That's our use of facilities. So it was shared with some key members of our school district that we felt could provide some valuable feedback. So we're still gathering that. So that may be a policy we may be able to bring forward. Have you heard, have you heard from anybody? I did hear from, um, I know uh, Maria Panucci had provided some feedback to something we want to take a look at what she provided. And I would need to look back to my emails to make sure I didn't oh, that's miss okay. someone else. I'm just, oh, I the band. The band had looked at it as well. Good. Yes. We, we sent it out to people who really used the facilities quite a bit to see if there was something missing or something that wasn't clear. Good. I think, Vince, you got a copy of that. I did. Yes. So not, the whole committee is not going to be there on Wednesday. No, this is. I, I want to attend one or two just to acclimate myself to it, but I, I don't want to make it a quorum. If there's four members going to be there, I can't come. Oh, you're very welcome to join us. I, I might. I will not be there. But I'll take your place. Okay, okay thanks, Jeannie. Um, Westmore Intermediate Unit, Jennifer will have a report next meeting. She had to leave the meeting today for a, um, um, something that came up in her family. We'll move on to Technology Committee. Scott? I'll take that. Um, and Central Westmoreland. You may as well do both of them. Yeah, there's uh, one motion next week, T00421, three-year agreement between Hempfield Area School District and Airspring for the purposes of additional coax-based voice circuit capacity to be approved. And then under Central Westmoreland Career and Technology Center, V00121, it's at the 2021-2022 budget of the Central Westmoreland Career and Technology Center be approved. Um, total budget for 2021-22 is $8,848,829. The Hempfield Area School District will be required to fund CWCTC $1,702,281.30, less the state, state subsidy of $181,271 for a net cost to Hempfield Area School District of one million five hundred twenty-one thousand ten cent or ten dollars and thirty cents, and we are having our meeting this Thursday, so I have much more to report at our next meeting. Wayne, how does that impact our budget to change? Is it a change? Um, actually, since the preliminary budget that was shared, our cost went down by one hundred seven thousand dollars, but compared to last year, it's up maybe sixty or seventy thousand but with a substantial increase in enrollment. So I, th I think considering the increase in enrollment, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, I think the tuition costs actually a little bit less per student next year than in our current year. That's really good news. And I mean, I know I've had various conversations with Tammy that you're so excited about the students from here being able to go to tech school and to learn, you know, a career. And we have to look at this budget as part of our overall budget that's helping these these children and students get to the next level i think it's awesome we're looking i think the projection is for 264 students next year um i think when i first came we were in the 180 range their so highest it, number it, that's, it's been continually growing over the last several years scott these kids are getting pretty good jobs when they get out of there yeah. too aren't they yeah they have i mean they're doing great uh great things with co-ops um, they're able to co-op with companies on our advisory boards and yeah they're able to you know be be placed in jobs right out of right out of school so right out of high school so it is beneficial and Wayne kind of alluded to the fact that you know as, as the, the more students that go the less per student it is so um, it's actually beneficial when we when we do send a lot of students uh, from all districts so so it's it's not um, you know we encourage that so um, it's a great thing. We've got great things going on down there. We encourage all the students to look into it and attend. All right. Any other board members' questions or comments? Anybody? There was a technology committee meeting this past week. I don't know if we want Dr. Connor maybe to share a little bit of what occurred at that meeting. Sure. Uh, a couple updates were given to the committee. Um, I didn't notice that. Talked about our, our website refresh that we're working on right now. 
also gave an update to the district branding committee and also the district's data warehouse committee. Um, reviewed the projector replacement plan. Um, generally, we did push that off till next school year because um, our next steps will be bringing in different samples for members of the committee to try out and give us recommendations. But that'll be worked into um, the five-year technology plan when it's created. Um, also looked at our current Chromebook um, allocation um, this summer. There'll be a collection of all Chromebooks, K-12, and making sure that we have a correct allocation and um, audit of each of those devices for next school year. I'll give the, the committee an update to the current FID plans, as you heard earlier this evening. And then we also talked uh, briefly about a couple apps that were purchased out of ESSER funds and whether or not the committee recommended uh, renewing them or not for next school year, because um, I just got the renewal um, quotes in the mail, and of course things have gone up. So looking at usage um, this school year and what they projected for us needing in the future. So that, just, that was just a few of the items that were reviewed. Anything else, Tammy? No, that was that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Any board members question that? Paul, go ahead. I actually just wanted to go back quickly to the um, CWCTC um, the question on that. It, I just wondering, and I know that we've talked about the the value they bring to the students and the opportunities the students have, and that it's under it's been underutilized to a large extent um, as an as an option, as a viable option, as opposed to um, you know some other career paths. Um, and I wondered if we at some point could have um, a presentation and ha have some information here for the board, because I think it would be good, you know, uh, I've been on the board for a little while, but I think it would, I, I, I know s some of what's done there, but I think when I've talked right. to, to Dr. Learn, I've learned more of what maybe I didn't know about um, the CWCTC. So I think it would be good for us to have some education on what goes on there. And, and it may be able to leverage that that meeting so that people know that it's going to be discussed and it could be a way to um, get some advertising for that. It's, I think it, go ahead. About the meet and greet Thursday? There, there's a meet and yeah. greet Thursday evening at the CWCTC. Yeah. Are we able to invite school board members? Yeah, we're, we're having a, a meet and greet. Oh, okay. I, I do believe we're able to do that. Um, I know it was for the, for the superintendents, but... Um, you can join me. Please join me. Okay. <laughs> so as far as the presentation here, um, Dr. Werlicki and I have been 30 to 6, I in, believe. Yeah, I'll get you the information. Um, um, but we've been in discussion with having um, Mr. Lucia, our executive director, come up because he's, he's uh, very energetic and he's very proud of what's going on at the school. So we've, we've just had a full, we've had a full agenda for our, for our next couple meetings and but it's definitely going to happen. Um, I lo I'd love for everyone here to meet them. We are the, the biggest sending district um, out of the 10 districts, and very proud of that. And the students are doing great. I mean, every, every week there's, a, there's another student from Hemfield as student of the, student of the month, and, and you know, they're, um, they're, they're doing well. So our students are doing well. So, yeah, I'm, we're definitely going to make that happen. I'd love for everybody to listen in, you know, when that happens and, and get a little more education on on what's going on now, you know, down there with uh, with the CTC. So, okay, thank you. You also have um, the the dinner that they usually invite us to a dinner, and just to see that firsthand, that that's that, that's just one part of it. But yeah. you get to see so many other things, and and that's that's always informing informative. Yeah, we usually have it around Christmas. We have the Christmas yeah. dinner, and it's our um, award ceremony. But just because of the pandemic, we we've had to curtail that a little bit. But um, believe Next me, year. it Next we're, year. we're looking. We're yeah, Next we're looking year. to. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be. We'll get it. Should be banner. So, Good. just don't miss it. <laughs> Any other questions from board members? Tell you what, I've been around a long time and seen a lot of people on different committees, and I don't know if the public realizes the work that you have to do when you go to them. And Scott. Uh, the passion you take for us down there and bring it back to us, um, unbelievable. I, I, I've seen it with the library too, with Diane and with Jen and with, with Jeannie, but I mean your passion for down there really makes it feel like we're involved and that's a good thing because that's becoming real important, that career opportunity for these children. Thank you, 
So thank you. Um, <clears throat> we'll move on to school board, and we do have two items we'll be um, voting on, and that's uh, for Pam, you can say her last name, to be our secretary again, Kevin Ibasevich. Ibasevich. And then for Robert Rigger, uh, whether we might vote for him or not for assistant uh, secretary. Uh, we'll vote for him because he's got to do the, gen the roll call. <laughs> and then we'll move on to reports of, of uh, reports on school safety, security, workman's comp. Any report at all, Dan? Nothing to report. Okay. Drug awareness, Mike? Nothing to report. We do have a meeting coming up, I believe, in a couple weeks. We'll post it. I, I don't have it right in front of me. Okay. And PSBA, Jeannie, you may as well run the gamut. <laughs> I don't have anything for PSBA for this meeting. I will have something for our um, regular board meeting in two weeks. Um, I do not have anything for the foundation. I do know that the um, scholarship committee met this evening and they were looking through the applications for scholarships. Um, and we will be awarding um, at least two and perhaps three this year. Could, could someone, too, give us a report on how many scholarships and what money we had for the whole class, not from us, but from everywhere? Because yes. I know one year it was just an astronomical. I just gave that to Mr. Wagner because we're working on a refresh of our website, and that is going to be one of the data points that we're going to include. I do not have that figure off the top of Oh, no, of not my now. Head, I mean, at some yes. point in time. I wasn't asking for now. I would have called We, we you did that. just get that for the 20... 19-2020 school year. Well, it's nice to put yes. on a board meeting and brag about our students, you know, when it comes time for graduation. We're trying to start including that on our website. It was 2.5 million. Thank you. And while we're putting out accolades for passion to stuff, I mean, Jeannie and her PSBA stuff, I don't know how you sit there on those <laughs> meetings all the time. I tried to sit there. You're on your own for a while anyway, but we'll move. Thank you, Jeannie. We'll move on to Hemphill Library and Jennifer had to leave. As I said, anything, uh, Diane, at all? No. No, the, uh, the bids are... The bids are coming in, and uh, we'll be making. They'll be making decisions on, on who they choose for the architect and, and everything else. Cool. And you know, it meaning uh, talking about the scholarships. If you've ever been to one of the award ceremonies, they have pages and pages of scholarships that they've been given from different places. It is amazing. It's it's just it's it's wonderful. So that's why I was asking for yeah. that to be brought in here. Yes. The total number, the total yes. amount. Some of the schools they're going to. Our kids achieve so well. Oh, they do. And it's they're a wonderful. it's a really well kept yeah. secret sometimes. Yep. And yep. it's not well kept because you don't share it. It's just well kept because maybe we don't get it out of there enough. I don't <laughs> know. But okay, no hearing of citizens on non agenda items. I don't think. And is there anything for the good of the board at all? All right, hearing none, do I have a motion, motion. for adjournment? Motion. Oh, wait a minute, one last thing. I want to give kudos to Rob Ronald and, and also Dave. I don't know your last name. I mean, to watch them move around and get these microphones going, really a good job. Thank you very much. And put up with you. us. And, yeah. Knowing you, is that really their names, Tony? Or is it just their <laughs> I changed it. And motion. you know what? Somebody else make a motion for adjournment. <laughs> motion by Mike. Do we, what's that? We, we, we are, and I announced that mm -hmm. in the beginning. Oh, okay. I already announced it. I'll second. Uh, motion by Mike for adjournment. Do I have a second? I'll second. Paul second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion 